Good evening. Oh, you know what I just realized that I didn't do that. Um, the last, the first two series, I did not say that. Uh, I did not say good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Right? Thank you. I can't believe that nobody called me out on that either. Um, thank you as always for coming out tonight. Um, just a few quick announcements before we get started. For those of you who are new um, to us, the bathrooms are in the hallway and to the left. Um, the programs are live streamed online on both Facebook and YouTube channels, so you can always watch them afterward, or if you can't make it, you can watch them while they are live streamed online. And then I do ask that everybody silence their cell phones now. That is something that I don't ever forget to, um, to say, but sometimes I forget to silence my own cell phone. So. Um, you can call me out on that one if you ever hear my phone going off. And then just um, the shameless plug for the library, we do have our little bookworm story time and crafts on Thursdays at 5 p.m. and Fridays at 10.30 a.m. Um, Ms. Bree reads a story and does craft for kids, so if you have children or grandchildren ages 3 to 3 k um, tell, them, tell them to bring them to the library and um, all their parents and their grandparents and anybody else who can get them to the library. It's a great program. And then uh, for those of you who, who was here last week, okay, so you will remember my locomotive plan words that, that failed to pick up steam last week. So I thought I'd change up my game this week and spend a little more time coming up with a coin pun, but no matter how hard I tried to mint an idea, they just uh, none of them in the end made any sense. Um, so you can take out that to the bank for what it's worth. And all jokes aside, we are happy to have Patrick Kibble here tonight from Ohio's own Osborne Coinage, the oldest private mint in America, which was recently, um, just last week, featured on the Manufacturing Marvels, Marvels segment of Fox Business News, and we may be able to um, show everybody that tonight. So to introduce Patrick, I'm going to pass the mic on to a great stone by the board member, Dan Percy. Good evening. Glad to see you all here. Last week, we competed against Cupid and God with Valentine's Day and Ash Wednesday. Today, uh, we may be competing against nice weather. <laughs> um, a few things I did want to tell you about before I introduce Patrick. Osborne Coin is important to the Great Set of Society because how many people here have purchased our 150th anniversary coin? How many people have those? Okay, those folks who haven't raised your hands, those are available tonight uh, in uh, Copper. We, we did this project as a fundraiser. And we uh, went to Osborne Coin, had them design a coin for the 150th anniversary of our Vita. And we first produced them in pure silver, one ounce of silver. I told Patrick uh, this evening that I wish we had ordered twice the amount that we ordered because they sold out almost immediately. Uh, and Ed Mauer, who is not here tonight, uh, he and I and our wives went to Osborne Coin and we got to see them stamping those silver coins as they were being uh, stamped from the docks, uh, which was a real experience. Now, they were so successful that we then did this in Goldeen. Uh, Goldeen is not actual gold, but it's, it resembles a gold uh, color. There are only two of those left, and those two are here tonight. One of them is paired up with a copper coin, and that's going to be in our raffle, our raffle basket. Is that right, Kara? It is going to be in the raffle basket. Okay, so if you don't have uh, any of those coins, you can get two tonight if you are the winner on the raffle basket. Okay. Um, we then produced them in copper, and those are the ones that we have left. Uh, I would like to tell you that next week's speaker is going to be 
uh, Sean McIntyre, who's the curator of the Braddock Batter Battlefield Museum in Braddock, Pennsylvania. He's going to be here to talk to us about the Battle of the Monongahela. That, uh, well, it wasn't the first skirmish, but it was the first major skirmish of the French and Indian War that resulted in the, uh, uh, the English uh, being defeated at the hands of the French and, and Indians uh, at the Battle of the Monongahela. Uh, he will be here next week, so we encourage all of you to come for that. Now, Patrick Hipple. Patrick Hipple is currently a new numismatic and wholesale distribution account executive at Osborne Mint in Cincinnati, Ohio. He's a proud graduate of Edge Hill University outside of Liverpool, England, and he was inspired to pursue a career in numismatic sales after discovering the long history of Osborne coinage. Uh, a very long history that he's going to tell you about tonight. Prior to working at Osborne Mint, he was the district manager at Wine Trends Heidelberg, where he was responsible for luxury wine sales in Southwest Ohio. In his free time, he can be found reading, traveling, running with his beloved dog, and he is an avid collector of science fiction memorabilia. So I would like to ask all of you to join me in welcome, welcoming Patrick Hippel as our speaker this evening. Patrick. Thank you very much, Dan. There you go. Hello, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Uh, unfortunately, I don't have any mint-related jokes, so please forgive me. No. Uh, but how many people here, you guys all already uh, said you have picked up our coins from the Great Stone Viaduct. Have you been to a Chuck E. Cheese? Raise your hand. Yeah. Been on a cruise? Raise your hand. Yeah. So have you been traveling to other countries and touched their currencies and their coins? Yeah. And you have touched one of our products. Pretty much, whether you realize it or not, Osborne coinage has been a part of your life. Either from transport tokens, whether it be casino tokens, any one number of things, lottery mats, car washes. We've been around for 189 years, and we've done any one number of different projects. We've been located near Cincinnati, Ohio that entire time. Pretty much we established in 1835. A uh, couple of years after this Great Stone Viaduct, but we were doing pretty good. Same year, the Liberty Bell uh, cracked. We've been in uh, continuous operation ever since our foundation in 1835. Now, we actually grew up around Dayton, Ohio, just south of there, just north of Cincinnati. We started off as a stamping company and doing coal script. How many people here are familiar with textile script, steel script, coal script, all from this area? A lot, a lot of you have probably seen different types of it. What Osborne actually perfected was we were able to create a register that not only produces script, but we're able to count the script and register it all at the same time. Essentially, what would happen back in those days with coal script textile, we had Patrick's coal company, Patrick's textile company. I'd have my employees, but there'd be other coal companies, other textile companies out there. And they'd want my employees who are pretty experienced. So look for them. They would offer more money. So to get around that, I wouldn't pay them in US currency. I'll pay them in script that would only work with my general sort, Patrick's general sort I am. So pretty much all the coal appellations, coal scripts, textile scripts, almost all that came from Osborne. So, during this time, that pretty much drives through the first 20 years, so from 1835 to about 1850, 1855. Coming around to 1840s, early 1850s, we started working on many projects, stamp projects, just different, different uh, types of currencies to get away with coal script, but then we started getting into currencies and coins. And this point is more of a numismatic coin. And we started doing campaign points. We started doing them for McKinley, Taft, a number of U.S. presidents. We have Abraham Lincoln up here. Abraham Lincoln he did all of his campaign and his inauguration points. We did it for a number of people. Uh, at that time, we actually did a couple of the Southern uh, generals. But in this case, with Abraham Lincoln, once he got elected, even back then, in the 1850s, that was still a thing. We had to do two separate dots back then to work computers. 
It wasn't such a uh, simple thing as just pushing the button, all of a sudden I have a new design that pops up. I can go ahead and put that in the computer and kind of pull a new die. So we actually have dies for both Abraham Lincoln with a beard and Abraham Lincoln without a beard. Because growing up, after he was elected, he wasn't quite sure whether or not he wanted to shave or not, whether or not he was going to grow his beard. But as most things with men, we left to a lady, or in this case, a young girl, just coming up to him uh, after the uh, campaign, he had been elected, comes up to him and goes, Mr. Lincoln, you look much better with a beard. Pretty much after that, he always wore a beard. So we can die, so we still have to this day. We have them under lock and key. They're brought out occasionally. We'll be out for special events later this year. But the big thing about them is back during the late 1800s, early 1900s, somebody decided to go ahead and try to do some restrikes. We can take old dyes and try to use them over again. In this case, you look over here on the right, you see right there the cracks right down the center of it. This is what happens when you take an old dye and try to put it into new machinery that it's not properly used from. We still have them to this day. We still hold on to them. We still bring them out, and we'll see some new sets come out based on all these eyes. A couple other things, real quick, about that time during the Civil War. There was four branches of the U.S. Mint, one of which was located in the North in Philadelphia. The other three were located in Charlotte, Dahlonega, Georgia, and New Orleans. So once the South seceded and war was declared. One of the first things they did was seized those three mints down south, which left only Philadelphia operating for the Union. We have a couple pieces of paper, some documentation. Osborne Coinage is one of the few private mints, if not the only private mints, that's ever received a special disposition from the U.S. government to produce U.S. currency during the war years. Now, during those times, we might have been producing for other people. There's possible rumors, suggestions, but that's all alleged. And during the war, we helped get the Union through it. Late 1800s, 1900s, we basically started going more and harder into tokens, currencies. World War II happened. About a week or two before World War II came up, we received a giant load of metal to be used for new coins, new stampings, and wars declared. Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, which means that all metal and everything went on the right ration. So Osborne Coinage, like most manufacturing companies, stepped in to help the U.S. government during the war effort. One of the big things we made was carabiners for paratroopers, plus also other U.S. military uses. Um, second thing we did, and we actually brought some of the dyes out here with us tonight, but there was Office of Price Administration. And during the war years, you'd ration, you'd ration meats, you'd ration fats, you'd ration disposable items metals all for the war effort you would get ration books coupon books so in some families say your mother father two kids you'd want to go to the store and get your pound of meat you take your ration books your coupon books and you take it and you get your pound now let's say you just had a husband and a wife don't have the two kids don't need a full pound well what started happening during the early years of the war you'd go you take your coupon there wouldn't necessarily be a change equivalent to give back so either you got your pound of meat or you lost your ration Ration tokens is where that came in. It's a form of change. Start making it a little bit more equitable for everybody. They reached out to Osborne Coinage, and we produced ration tokens throughout the war for both the United States and for Canada. Over 5 billion were produced, 1,300 people working 24-hour shifts during this time. One of the big things, we'll talk about this here in a minute, it does say that there, uh, we were uh, pretty much a non-fair guaranteed counterfeit by Osborne. And even to this day, we're one of the few mints who's never been counterfeited. Here you can see an example of the Caribbean. Very basic cells, still the same thing. Look right down there, Osborne Cornish. We do have a couple of Caribbeaners, plus also one of the original script machines on display. This is that natural history museum. So, OPA, standing for Office of Registration. The rationing originally started back in 1942. So there was two different types. The blue tokens were used for processed foods, red tokens for meats and fats. Basically, these were not coins. Remember, again, I just mentioned that we received a large load of metal that we were not allowed to use. Eventually, we did use that for carabiners and other uh, items for the war effort. But what these OPA tokens were was vulcanized rubber, basically, celluloid. They were all basically one point each, and again, they were used as a change system. 
there are a number of different letters on each one of these dies and on each one of these tokens. There's a number of reasons, speculation of what this actually is. Most people believe it's an anti-counterfeiting, but there's no real rhyme or reason to what they are. I would like to say thank you real quick also to Dan, who has provided us with a complete set of OPA tokens, which you can see all different combinations up there. There's 30 different red ones, 24 blue ones. They're still collected to this day. You still find them. The rarest is a red MV. Now, as in all things during the war, once the war finished, we couldn't necessarily just start throwing things away. We were still rationing, we we're still conserving. So even something like OPA tokens, even though they were no longer needed by the US government, we didn't just want to throw them away. So for about five years after World War II, they became the basis of the government or currencies for the uh, country of Greece. Took all those old OPA tokens over there, sent them over there, and they used them until they could get their operations up and running. Here's a couple of examples for you. Now, after World War II, we have been uh, located up to World War II, pretty much from 1860 up to uh, 1945, 1950, located in downtown Cincinnati. After the war, with everybody coming back, we started to move a lot of the manufacturing processes out of the downtown cities. We started to have more population growth, people started visiting downtown. So we moved out into what was essentially the meat packing district of Cincinnati. Part of this, the reason why we did that was because all the floors were already reinforced for all, all of our equipment and our vaults. This particular location, we have a number of vaults all throughout the facility. While going through these, we actually found the original OPA token, these dies. What looks like a chunk of metal is really a blanking press and then a cutting press. With one cut, it hits the coin, or it cuts the coins, the next hit is able to strike the coin or in this case, the OPA token. The materials are just slide flow through from one side and it's right to cut. Now, if you look right back here, you can see right here the original dots. You notice there was a bunch of different sizes. Up here on the right are essentially what little millimeter caps off the top of each one of these dots. When the die would wear out, we wouldn't pitch the entire die. We would just get a saw, cut off the top, and then basically go back, rework the die so that way it's operable again for a new token and move on. So you'll have a number of different sizes, all different uh, lengths, but all the reason why is because every single piece of metal was conserved. Here's a couple more examples. Back here from 1944, you start seeing uh, tags, quality control tags, from back in 44, 45. Now, when the front page is going through the balls, and we have to find this little cache of OPA dies, one thing we did find when we were going through everything was, evidently in this particular case, coffee was only five cents a cup. So even back then, the coffee fund was a thing. So, after uh, going and helping the United States government with OPA tokens, the Canadian government reached out to Osborne. And during that time, we also did Canadian ration tokens as well. The same basic principle, only real difference between these, they're also in English as well as French. So there's a number of different uh, parts we have up here. They all came from local Cincinnati and local Kentucky uh, companies. So a number of different die strikers and a number of different uh, manufacturing companies all contributed to help out. We go through, we find a lot of the quality control tokens or quality control stamps on each one of these. And those who are interested, we are all available here to see tonight. So that brings us up to the more modern times. We started becoming, and especially here, you will notice there was a lot of transportation tokens, you had train tokens. Osborne produced a large majority, if not all the tokens for the Northeast United States. We worked with subway companies, transportation companies, car washes, train companies. We made over a million, 100 million tokens for the New York City subway system. Most other major transportation systems all came through Osborne. That took us through. We also did a number of collectible pieces for sports teams, whether it be in the NHL, uh, NFL, which would have been the AFL back then, but back during the 50s, 60s, and 70s. 
the 1960s, we basically went into the installation of high-speed coining presses. So these would allow us to go from being single strike. So if we were to go through and have a look at some of the old equipment that was used in the early 1900s, we would use things called drop presses, spin presses. Drop presses where literally you'd have to pull the hammer back and let it go and the coin would be struck. Coins have not changed how they were minted in the last few thousand years. It's still the same principle. You have a piece of metal on one side, a piece of metal on the other side. We have a blank of metal in the middle, and we use that and crush that metal together and force that metal to flow where we want it to. Back then, we'd use the drop presses, heavy anvils crashing down on each other. We use spin presses where they just use triple force to force something down at a fast rate. But these high, high speed coining presses that would come in, again, allow us to start going into new mass production areas. Coins were used for gasoline coin games. So uh, I don't know how many people here in the 70s remember the Shell gas station presidential tokens they used to give away at almost every Shell gas station. That was us. We would have new markets and applications that would come through. New Orleans, now with these high-speed coin presses, we can start taking aluminum. You start having those aluminum doubloons that were thrown out during uh, Mardi Gras. We were the largest producers in the country of the Mardi Gras doubloons. The 1980s, we had video game come in and just took tokens to a different level. Video games came in, you had quarter replacements. Everybody here probably has been to an arcade at one point or another. You take your dollar up, you get your tokens, and you just only can play at that particular uh, location. To this day, we have never been counterfeited as a company. We could take almost every car wash and, well, we could take every car wash and laundromat right here in Bel Air. We could give each one of them their own individual specialized token and not a single one of them cross pollinate with any one of the other locations. So it's a great way for everybody to just go ahead, forces or it doesn't force, it helps inspire loyalty in your customers. New products have been developed, stripped hands and tokens for Philadelphia septic system, two piece high security biometallic tokens for Garden State Parkway. A lot of these different things are things we have innovated. Biometallics, we've used other different companies. A number of different processes go into uh, the changers. We use ma ma magnetic frequencies. We use lasers to read different designs on the coins. So there's a number of different ways we can go about trying to prevent counterfeiting. 1990s, Osborne has installed next generation coin impresses. We've been going into more high end, high end numismatics, silver, gold, copper. In the 1980s, we started doing a lot more pop culture items. We teamed up with Kenner. Uh, I'm sure everybody here either at one point collected or had brothers or sisters, nieces, nephews who all collected Star Wars items. In the 80s, they started including coins, aluminum coins with these items, these action figures. Some of those who are worth less than a tenth of a cent of aluminum are now worth thousands of dollars. So it's one of those big things we still work to this day with uh, Star Wars collectors, with uh, different aspects of Star Wars, different companies. It's a lot of fun. Um, partner with known corporations, why exciting high volume commercial success, successes, excuse me. Going back again to the Shell presidential program, we also did a starting lineup for Kenner. So, beginning in the 1990s, we have these high speed coin impresses. We'd never been counterfeited. What would be a great industry to go into? Gambling. So, we ended up becoming one of the largest suppliers of casino tokens on the planet. We started going out. We would have people come up here to Ohio. We would go out to Vegas. We made sure that we did all the high end tokens. So, your fives, your $10,000 tokens. Osborne's responsible for those. This is also part of the reason why very few people actually heard of Osborne up to the last 15 years. We were located in downtown Cincinnati and would have millions of dollars of US legal tender on hand. So we would never advertise. We always prefer to ourselves as being the man behind the curtain. Better not to put a giant neon sign on us and say, hey, here we are. So between our anti counterfeiting technology X mark, we were able to get away with not being counterfeited. 1998. Ontario, Canada's Gaming Commission required that there be no crossplay between any and its any of its 22 casinos. And again, going back to what we had talked about when it comes to laundry mats, car washes, with these casino tokens, 22 high-end casinos, low-end casinos, mid-tier, does not matter, 
We had the small, low end chips. We had the high end chips. Never was counterfeited. And we were able to provide chips unique to each location. So a lot of fun, but there's a lot of engineering that goes into these. Uh, program was such a success. Casinos from as far away as Argentina and Greece came to Osmo for Xmark tokens. Upwards of 250 million tokens were ordered by casinos from all over the world. So we get to the late 1990s, early 2000s, and what technology came in? It kind of makes coins a little bit obsolete. Anybody want to take a guess? Credit cards. Credit cards and credit card tracking. When you go to a casino now, you don't necessarily take your $100 bill and get $100 in casino tokens. You're going to go play the tables. Yeah, you still do that. But you'll probably do it on your credit card or your room key. This allows the casino to be able to tell what games you're playing, how long you're staying on that particular game, when you're going to go eat, when are you going to your room. So, like most industries, we said, okay, we're one of the largest producers of casino tokens. How do we go ahead and deal with this issue? So we took a slight pivot. As I mentioned before, we didn't advertise because we had hundreds of millions of dollars of U.S. legal tender on the premises. Casino tokens are considered legal tender. So our pivot was instead of having somebody send us millions of dollars and have us destroy it, we went to the casinos. We would essentially take a mobile destruction unit and we would go down, meet up with the IRS at the location. Our representatives would go down there and literally with each casino token, you'd count it, you destroy it count it and throw it in the destruction, the destruction device. And the IRS would sit there and count and account for each one of these tokens. Ironically, we were the largest producer of casino tokens on the planet. We ended up making more money destroying our tokens than we did making them. And we still have the destruction device to this day. So we've gone through and we've been successful in a number of different industries, whether it's transportation, whether it's casinos, whether it is numismatics, but now we're in the new age, the 2020s, and we're starting to develop a few more things. We have a number of different areas that Osborne has moved into. We have since become an international net. As I mentioned before, we do uh, currencies for a number of different countries. We have shipped to six of the seven continents. And if I'm able to get an account on Antarctica, I will ship down there too, just to make that seven for seven. But no, every European country, every North American country, majority of South American countries. We have produced currencies for multiple nations. We still do to this day. Uh, we've been the largest pro provider of casino tokens in the world. We're the only mint to never be counterfeited. So part of being this international mint is we started moving into high-end numismatics. You'll see some of them up here. Silver, gold, copper, platinum. We have a number of different finishes, points that have really developed over the years. Just going away from a simple piece of metal. You now high end silver, you have something called platies, different finishes if you will, like antique, ruthenium, bimetals, RFID, radio, radio frequency identifier chips. Osborne has been split into a number of different companies. We have a tokens division, which takes care of your uh, cruise liners, Chuck E. Cheese, um, car washes. You're a little bit more industrial, but highly legal, highly manufactured, solar grade. Osborne Coinage, which does a lot of commemorates. We work with a number of multinational corporations around the world. Recovery services, uh, safety awards, commemorative awards, as you see right there, Fiona the Hippo, Cincinnati Zoo. We have a new magazine division, which does the silver, the copper, we do a number of different designs, whether it be ingots, uh, octagons, different shapes. We are now a fully self-contained unit under one roof. We have been in our entire existence. We have engineers, tool shops, engravers, artists, sales people, everybody's under one roof. It allows us to work pretty much as a unit in a really tight group, but it allows us to do everything from beginning design elements all the way to the end to a number of different and just this past year we were voted one of the 100 most influential companies in 2024 
So we also partnered up with a number of system companies, Commonwealth and the World Dutchman's. We are vertically integrated from refinery to end. So we've managed the last 189 years through the same basic process and taking it and adapting and pivoting each step of the way into new and new processes. Are there any questions? Yes. We're located downtown in Camp Washington. So, so we're located, uh, are you familiar with where University of Cincinnati is? Oh, okay, excellent. The Hopple uh, 75, that's it. 75 and Hopple Street, right there in Camp Washington. We're actually based on a city block. And the ironic thing is, for 16 years, I worked within a mile of our, my current office. I had no idea that this existed yeah. there. It actually grew up around city block. Uh, we're connected with tunnels underneath. You could drive by, you would never realize there's a manufacturing plant right there. It's designed to be. It's designed to be inconspicuous. Very low profile. Very low. Yes, they are. There's a number of people who collect them. Um, I get calls pretty much on a monthly basis still, and I'm asked for their designs, particular. Um, Numbers for letters. So as you saw, the average price for collective. It just really depends. If you see the different combinations there, there's 30 different red, 24 blue. The MD is the most rarest of them. I've heard pricing anywhere from five dollars up to fifty dollars. It really just depends. Like any collectible, it's based completely on how uh, Rarely available is. Some of these, I know some people have been looking for for ages and have never packed. So. Yes, sir. That time, no. We went up. We would have done it under the offices of the U.S. Mint uh, for the simple reason is that at that time, uh, we were probably doing it on our own more of a plan than this. It's more, it's more important to keep their processes going smoothly. Now, as I mentioned before, when we were talking about that, now, rumor and illusion, and allegedly, it is possible that during that time, uh, everybody knows where Cincinnati is located. Uh, it's located on the Ohio River, and Kentucky, the South Sea, and the Southern. So it's highly possible that Patrick came in at 8 a.m. in the morning and I would run the currency. I would work with the US government because he was taking care of me and my crew. Five o'clock comes around, I punch my clock, I turn off the light, I go home and I don't think you another. And let's say that a couple hours later, Patrick too comes in, not the same as the first one, completely different individual. He comes in with his own crew and produces coinage throughout the night. And say around 4 or 5 a.m. before it gets light, they load everything up on the buggy, take it over the river, send it over to the other side of the river, and gold comes back. So, uh, allegedly, it is highly possible that we might have produced those times during the Civil War. So, um, how safe is it to ship these coins? And how many employees do you approximately have? We have approximately 75 employees, and shipping. Coins is just like shipping any other precious metal. We're not going to put big signs on it, uh, looking with the exact weights are, denominations, or what their items are. Uh, so it's going to be non boxes, boxes, uh, trusted shippers, and not always necessarily point out to the US man, um, which is not shot on the US man, my apologies. Uh, but it is more of us having companies that we know of, we associate with, and we insure. It's a fairly basic process. Yes, sir. Uh, I have a question about the uh, coin that was produced by Austin Martin for the Great Survival Society. Yes, sir. So that's a, what you call a high relief coin. There are different there are different descriptions of high relief. And so Can you explain a, to everyone exactly how that coin was designed? Pretty much going from start to finish, the beautiful thing is being an Osborne, we start off 
with layouts. I want to go back. We look up here at the top left. This is the design sketch right here. This is essentially what our artists would have started with. We would base it roughly on the great stone by that's here behind me. So we take images provided by the customer in this case, the great stone by that's have our artists look at it and start putting together layouts and designs. At that point, it is sent out and we have some design input from back from the company. Now, I have received napkins from drunken sailors at 2 a.m. in the morning. Sent to me and said, Can you make something out of this? Yes. <laughs> it doesn't matter what condition it comes in. Somebody can give me just a couple words, not artists will run with it. We can get napkins and bar to go out and do that. Or we can get fantastic arts into us with images, design, and ideas. But all of that starts basically with the artist. The artist comes together with the concept, puts it together in a layout that gets to the customer. Question? Pardon? Yes, sir, we do. Um, so pretty much once the artist does the layout, the customer approves it, and we do what's called dies. Much like the OPA dies are up here, essentially goes back to the same concept. You're going to have a hard piece of hardened steel with a chunk of metal and choose two pieces of hardened steel. We're going to try to force that metal into the crevices we want on the die. Now, what Dan is referring to is high relief. There's different types of relief. Tokens or more industrial coins tend to be a lower relief, a lower, um, just a lower relief, lower, lower thickness. High relief is more you can sculpt it. Think of it more as like a, uh, a bronze sculpture, a brass sculpture, or even a marble sculpture, just out of metal, flat metal. You want to get the design to come up, you want to get the dimensionality of it. Now, there are different types of high relief. There are such things as called smart mini. Essentially, the way you do smart mini is you have ultra high relief, and that's when you use powdered metals, you powdered metal blanks. That's a different process that we don't necessarily do right now, but various varying degrees of high relief. Does that answer the question, Dan? And, and are the coin that was produced for the Vibex Society, uh, how did you get the uh, relief onto the die? In other words, tell us a little bit about the development. So there's a number of different ways to do that. Oh, okay, I see where you're going this. Uh, up till the last year, for 35 years, we had a gentleman named uh, Tim Thompson on the staff who would actually carve the die with white hands. So dies are made of a part of the steel. Prior to being hardened, though, we do have a softer steel that we actually will engrave. We we'll use diamond cutters, laser engravers, or in some cases, they will still use hand tools and carve into the softened steel prior to hardening. In this particular case, the great stone biogas. You all know how the biogas looks. You have all the different dimensionality of the stone. You have all the little cracks. What Tim was able to do is go in by hand on something as small as a 39 millimeter coin, an inch and a half, and get a lot of those details in there by hand. The type of work this takes, we learn from his father, we learn from his father, it was a, one of those great skills that's passed down generation to generation. Um, these days, uh, unfortunately, very few people can still do this by hand. And we are looking for other ways to replace people. Essentially, it takes multiple artists and lasers to replace the work of one individual. So, what other questions do we have? Yes, sir. I don't think they're in business anymore, but Husky Cop in Danbridge, Pennsylvania, made copper slugs to be sent to the mints. Stamped into pens. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything like that? Who would give you the actual slugs we, that you, or would you make them yourself? We are a self-contained facility, and that includes the fact uh, that includes that we bring in up to three hundred different types of alloy, different types of metal. We do the blanking on site, so we don't actually have necessarily need somebody else to do it for us. This way, we're able to control to our specifications exactly each blank. We're able to rim them, burnish them, blank them from scratch. This also allows us to control the waste. Everything in Osborne's recycled from the steel to the different alloys. Uh, our roof is covered with solar panels to pay back into the system. So we try to be a very streamlined green operation, but also it's just 
economically sensible. Can you give us uh, some of the problems with trying to invent coins like ours mm -hmm. in gold, in silver, in the high or the more precious metals? So when you start talking about precious metals, it is all economy of scale. So if we're doing something in a base metal, um, I can have a couple uh, brass slugs and it's going to be 30, 40 cents of brass per coin. Sometimes, depending on the size, it'd be a couple dollars. But when you start talking about silver and gold, it gets exponentially more expensive. Silver right now is around $24, $25 an ounce. Gold is around $2,000, $2,100 an ounce. So when you start talking about the economies of scale, it's really just coming down to the or the different alloys, it's coming down to the cost per alloy. Uh, platinum can be very expensive as well. So the big issue or the big uh, catch is you want to make sure you have everything dialed in as quick or as tightly as possible. Your specifications are as tight as possible, but also how you go about mending some of the softer items, so softer alloy items. With standard base metals, brass, bronze, they're hardened alloys. The steel, or not the steel, sorry, the metal itself is hardened already, not necessarily from a hardening process, it's just a hard alloy. Precious metals such as gold and silver are softer metals. Something as simple as a speck of dust or a piece of lint on both the die, on either the die or the blank, can ruin A, the die, and B, the coin. So in the case of a gold coin, that might be $2,500 right out the window for each, each mistake. So when you start talking about some of these items, such as precious metals, the big thing you have to look out for is, in our particular instance, we use clean rooms, separate rooms where just those items are manufactured or minted. They have separate ventilation systems, separate security systems. <clears throat> People must be cleared to go into those areas, but it also will clean. They'll make sure they stay in there for a while and finish their project before they come out, and then they get cleaned every night. Part of the reason why for this is every single time we touch the die, you want to make sure that gets cleaned off. As I said, any speck of dust, if it reaches on the die, it will imprint on each one of those silver blanks, ruining each piece of silver or each piece of gold. So if you have somebody who isn't paying attention and they strike 10 gold coins and there's a piece of dust on there, do the math. All of a sudden you start having $25,000 that has to go out the window and be scrapped. So it's a very labor intensive process. Uh, when it comes to the precious metals, silver and gold, we actually do hand strike or single strike, not necessarily hand strike, but single strike on each one of the higher alloys. Now with the high speed presses, they're still, they're gonna be high speed presses. They're gonna be hit multiple times. It might be a single strike, but it's gonna be a quick boom, gone. With the silver and gold, when I say a single strike, they're expected after every strike. I saw somebody over here had a question. Yes. I have a comment. Yes, please. I'm a board member and I have all three of your coins. Thank you. And I'm very happy to have the great stone buyback. Your detail is exquisite. Thank you very much. We greatly appreciate it. For the audience that does not win the basket, I might suggest we have them on our gift table. Uh, the copper coins are $10 a piece and they're in a plastic case for protection. The detail is overwhelming. And thank you very much, especially on the high-end numismatic coins. Come on over here. You'll see a couple of uh, country currencies, some pop culture figures, uh, busts, things along those lines. Uh, very much we have to have the detail in there. We currently use, and you'll see this in the Manufacturing Marvels video, uh, different programs to get that 3D effect. So that way we're able to go in back in the day, you do it by hand, you do it in a plaster, do it in a... Uh, You'll do a chunk of clay, you just carve your design, we'll pour plaster on it, and we'll use that chunk of plaster to copy and to re reduce into a die, the design. Now with computers, we're able to do it all in 3D, be able to go back through, make revisions, and take some of those things, some of those techniques, such as hand techniques, and combine them with computers. Thank you. You keep such a low profile as a company. I, I grew up in Cincinnati, and I missed the first thing. It, as I said, for 15, 16 years, I worked within a mile of the company. I had no idea it was there. So it's a lot of fun. It's, in, it's a great job. It takes you around the world and to see all kinds of great things. And it's amazing that it comes from Cincinnati. It's Kellen. I want to know what 
Who designed the bottle of snowman? Was it an actual signing or just an artist's rendition? I will take credit. I will take credit for the idea, but the artist in the house, I cannot remember who actually did that particular one, but it was one of our in house artists. <laughs> and yes, you can tour. If anytime somebody wants to come down, please feel free to reach out to me. I do have business cards up here along with a couple of brochures for about Osborne as well as striking points. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me, groups, what have you, and we'll try to uh, schedule something and see what we can get done. Yes. Another question about the Bel Air Bridge. The Bel Air Bridge had paper that they used for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And then I believe it was sometime late 70s, 1980s, they started to use tokens. Is there any way that you could find out if those tokens, the Lloyd Bridge tokens, uh, it would be uh, Interstate Bridge Company, I N O C, uh, and I B C O is the insignia on the token. Some of them are still around. Do you know whether they would have been produced? It, it's possible they were. Um, unfortunately, I can go back and look, but I cannot guarantee anything past the last 20, 30 years. Um, 70s, 80s, a lot of those records, unfortunately, are either paper in the basement and vaults, or they did not survive. So we still have a lot of records, but... Unfortunately, it's kind of hard to tell about some of the specific 50s, 60s, 70s transportation tokens. Yes. Um, I would like to have a uh, in color. Do you have one of those today? Uh, I, I do not think so. And do you have them for sale? Uh, ask me after. Okay. And I'm, I'm sorry. So, 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 oh. Who are your competitors? There's a number of different competitors. Um, there's Mints across the United States. Uh, in my end, Numismatics, the, the U.S. Mints competitor, Royal Canadian Mint, the Royal Mint, um, New Zealand Mint. There's a number of Mints out there that we can be with. You have National Mints, you have Domestic Mints. You have what we in the industry refer to as paper Mints, not necessarily Mints that produce paper, but they're Mints on paper. On a piece of paper it says, yes, it's Patrick's Mint, and, um, located in Cincinnati, Ohio, but then I buy my things from overseas and I import. So the competition to a large degree is from China, uh, especially in this industry, uh, but it's also the national mints, international mints, the country mints. It's called page turn and coin turn, very much. Coin turn north to south. So to flip over, that would be my US currencies. And then page turns just like in a book. To your point, numismatics are page turn. It's by design. It, it's really by preference. I've seen some, generally speaking, if it is uh, actual country currency, it's almost always going to be uh, coin flip. But generally speaking, when you're talking about the art rounds and numismatics, it's going to be a page turn. Any other questions? Are you ready to identify marks on the coins themselves? Uh, blue gray here, right? The last few years, you'll start seeing that mark from a lot of the coins. So that's only a relatively new last 10 years. Okay. So, but prior to that, again, going back to the casinos, you didn't necessarily mark everything. The mark mark our tokens. Uh, there was more of a man behind the but that is called a mint mark, and the majority of coins you see will have one on it. Any other questions? We still got 10 minutes, so if anybody wants to ask questions, we can play the video. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Some years ago, it was said that the German penny was a, would work as a token in the New York system subway. And this is, of course, not quite counterfeiting, but uh, is this possible that a 
coin from a different uh, country. Anyhow, a different coin can be substituted for a, a higher value one. It, it, very, very possible. Very possible. Let's look at Canada. In Canada, a Canadian currency, well, as American currency, uh, for as long as I can remember growing up, I had a quarter that always looked to this Canadian quarter and American quarter because we didn't just get it in advance to each other. Uh, a lot of times when you take a roll of quarters with the bank, they should check each one of those quarters to make sure there's not a plug in there. Um, there are instances where different coins from around the world can be used in our money machines or for our uh, acceptors, what have you. It could be for any one number of different reasons. It could just be a magnetic frequency is the same or it just happens to be the right size. Now, part of U.S. law is there are prohibited sizes that we can mint. So pretty much everything we do is going to be a couple of millimeters plus minus difference from a U.S. currency, a U.S. quarter, nickel, dime, penny. It's prohibited for us to be able to copy those even sizes. I believe the way the law actually reads is it's illegal to do anything that it's going to do to an unsuspecting individual. So to try to avoid that, that's what it is compared to the sizes. So you're going to take one of my false or not, I don't want to say fault, one of my coins and substitute it for a U.S. tender or legal currency. To follow up on that, <clears throat> I've often wondered for newspaper machines, if you put quarters in or you put dimes in or whatever, mm -hmm. how does a machine know that the, it's the correct amount of change and how do they read the... It it's really just depends on what acceptor they're using, what type of machine they're using. Sometimes it can be just something simple as uh, the slot is designed for a particular uh, size quarter or their uh, penny or nickel dime, what have you, goes through, it's a little switch, but it's accessible. So it would be based on size. Now, nowadays, we'll use different things such as magnets, uh, computer readers, uh, lasers to read the side, and that's how you're able to tell and how you're able to think confidently. Along those lines, the only time I was one ever had somebody show up from the Secret Service was because we actually made a double sided quarter. It was not done the same dimensions as a quarter, it was done as an inch and a half from this large gold eating, much like the very same by that. The service showed up, said, hey, look, we're, we face the George Washington on the side, says copy right there, it's like, look, we weren't trying to do anything, we're not even going to argue with you, we're going to destroy the diet and move on. So it's the only time we've ever been asked about counterfeiting, not from wood. So we have a very good track record there, we're going to keep it going. So we've got other companies other than Street Stock Post Stock Center. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. We do have a video here. We'll start below. Sorry, go ahead. Are those copyrighted currencies? So the intellectual property is. So where a currency mission for you is, uh, in the case of the Great Stone Viaduct, I'll use that as an example. Technically, that image is owned. Not technically, it is owned by the Great Stone Viaduct. So, and we own the dyes. We want to do that as we keep the dyes on the premises because of temperature controlled bulks and it's also soil property as far as humidity is concerned. If I send those dyes out to somebody else and they get put in the garage, garage floods, uh, humidity damage them, what have you, it gets dropped in four or five times. But our presses are millions of dollars and I can't take the risk of one of our presses. Uh, so we keep everything on hand. The part of the terms of conditions to answer that question. Um, is that the intellectual property, the design on the die belongs to the customer, we own the design. We would never use those designs unless we had a written Yes, sir. When you engrave the dies, they are softer. They are soft. How do you harden them? It's a soft steel, and basically what we do is we manufacture the die blocks from scratch on the premises from soft steel. So we manufacture them for our specifications for our machines. Once we get those, we put them in cutters, the, computer, uh, the artists use computers to do the type of design, put it in the computer, and then we'll use a different type of device, whether it be a diamond cutter, laser, what have you, to cut soft and steel. At that point, then it goes through a heat treating process. That can take anywhere, the cutting can take anywhere from an hour or two to 24 hours, based on the complexity of the design. Uh, the great stone bio design, um, the front side, the obverse, Probably took 10 to 15 hours to cut that design and go piece of steel. Uh, but at that point, it usually takes about 24 to 48 hours in high temperature ovens 
the timber of that and maybe the quench, and there's a little bit more of a process there, but that's how we hard to seal. You can usually tell right away whether or not they were hardened properly. Uh, there would be just some discoloration of the dyes if they haven't been. Uh, but also, we'll do a couple test strikes. We do sample strikes. Part of the reason for that is, A, so the customer can see exactly what their point is going to look like before we go into production, but also for us to test the dye. We'd rather us test it on a sample press, and on a sample strike, we're going into production, and halfway through, all of a sudden, the dye cracks on us. Sorry. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite everybody down at some point. Please feel free to reach out. I'd love to have you all down. I'd love to see you all at one point. If there's no other questions, thank you very much.